rightly handled. Okay, we're going to be dealing with artres, which is a Greek word that means to build a road, to open up a road. This is the etymology of the word uh, in your life, and hopefully that road you open is smooth. It's safe, and you always have that way. And I think all of you know what the true way is. And that's how you build your road. Open your Bibles, if you would. We're going to start with Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1. With that word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads... My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Uh, That means in your mind. Excuse me. You keep my word, my orders, my plan of the day. Let it be yours. And there's no gender in this. It means family. Verse 2. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. You know, as long as you do that, he blesses you. That's why you have a long life. He takes care of you. And, of course, everything to his plan. But if you want to find peace, you've got to go to the Prince of Peace. Verse 3, Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. That's to say in your very mind. Let, let um, mercy, that's love and truth, be there. It will always lead you. The compassion is a mark of God's election. Verse 4, So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. You know, that's a lot. Our Father, as long as you follow His Word, it pleases Him. But men are kind of hard to please sometimes because maybe they don't know where you're coming from. Maybe they're a little bit on the other side of the road. So, But God always understands. But if you use common sense and you know how to reach them, I, I've not found anyone yet that's not reachable. Verse 5, I'm talking about human beings. 5, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Sometimes your own understanding can lead you astray. You have to check it out in God's Word. That's what His commandments are about. If you want His blessings, if you want that peace of mind, If you want a long life, then certainly you do it his way. Now, the next verse is the reason we came here. And it reads, verse 6, In all thy ways, that's your path, your road, acknowledge him, and he will direct thy paths. In other words, he will make that road smooth for you. Do you know what this word way here is? It, it is um, it, it, it is um, direct. Isn't that amazing? He will direct you in the right direction. Have you ever been lost, needed directions? I'm quoting the Hebrew word here, D-E-R-E-K, direct, which will, I'm sure our word direction comes from it, that you, you want to always head in that right direction. He will always bless you for it. He will always lead you. Languages fascinate me. They really do. How near sometimes they come. Uh, It's obvious we're one family because as the Latin welds most languages together, certainly Hebrew does the English and and others. Uh, So there you have it, his path. And in all thy ways acknowledge him. Every path you take, ask him. Discuss it with him. That's what prayer is about. And he shall direct thy paths. He will give you the um, 
the correct direction. Uh, verse 7. Be not wise in thine own eyes, for fear the Lord, and depart from evil. And one more verse. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Uh, turn, turn on with me to the Proverbs 11. Well, I have a new Bible, and I mean it's stuck. There. Chapter 11, verse 1. A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. You know, a lot of people think they can get away with anything they want to by setting up false witness, false balance, maybe cheating a little bit here and cheating there. You're not fooling him. He knows. And he considers it not just a little sin. He considers it an abomination. And so it is. You, you always, you cannot teach God's Word. You cannot be a witness for Him. Whoever you are, lay person, minister, uh, whatever. You can't do that and and not be right with people because they will spot you. But the main thing is God will. What happens when, if he considers you a thing of abomination, what does he do? He cuts you off. You can study all you want to. You can do whatever you want to. As long as you do it for devious reasons, you're not going anywhere because he's not going to release any deeper truths to you in the simplicity in which Christ teaches. So doing right by yourself and your friends, not, nobody's perfect. And certainly I've found that out the hard way in my own life. About the time I think I'm there, well, something happens. It's like an old mule we used to have. Uh, granddad decided if we could, the only thing, we didn't have to buy gas or anything, if we could break him from eating, it would be really thin. But about the time we got him broke, he died. So, you know, so there's nobody perfect. Things happen. But that's not cheating. That's what God's talking about here. He does not like that. You mess up every once in a while, he, maybe he even smiles when you try to get back in, in the harness. But to purposely have a false set of scales, Uh uh-uh, you're going nowhere. That's very, very important. And uh, it's too bad that we have people, even in politics today, that that do not take that for granted. Verse 2, Treasuries of wickedness uh, profit nothing, but righteousness delivereth from death. You could have all the money in the world, it's not going to do you any good if you get it the hard way, crooked way. But righteousness will get you eternal life. Verse 3, The Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish, but he casteth away the substance of the wicked. He's going to bless you. You know, many of you probably have been in a place and prayed about it, and you thought, man, I don't know how we're going to work this out. And boom, boom. It just falls in place when you pray about it and you talk about it. God makes it possible. Why? Because he loves you. And and besides that, it's his word. It's his promise. And it's so easy to please him. You know why it's easy to please him? What does he want from you? Mostly love. He wants you to love him. And that's that is so easy to do to love him for all he has done for us that that brings those blessings verse 4 he becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand but the hand of the the diligent maketh rich they just get ahead okay and um, 
it's it's real sad. You have a generation that it would seem that through politics we try to have handouts, and people won't give me, give me, give me. What did God say? You're you're not going anywhere. It, it is the the uh, diligent. That means those that use common sense. That that save here and and do the best they can there, and they're, they're going places. Why? Well, not only are they wise, but their wisdom comes from God, and God's going to see to it. Okay? Verse 5. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he... You know what? I'm in, I'm in, I'm in chapter 10. That's bad. And... We're going to drop back here to the false balance with pride. I'm going to pick it up at verse 2 and catch up here, okay? Sorry about that. I guess he wanted that added. Who needed that? Okay. Verse 2, when pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly, that's to say the humble is wisdom. It's going to come to you. Verse 3, the integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the perversiveness of transgressors shall destroy them. They destroy themselves. They think they're getting ahead. They think they're so really ahead of the game. But who's keeping score? Not man. God is keeping score. And that's where you're going to see the, where the chips fall. And they're not going to fall to the wicked. Verse 4, Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but... Um, but uh, righteousness delivereth from death. It gives you eternal life. Verse 5, the righteousness of the perfect will direct his way. And there's that way direct again. I'm not talking about the English word. I'm talking about the word way in he the Hebrew manuscript. It's your direction. Why? We, well, we know, again, you know who the way is. But the wicked shall fall down by his own wickedness. He destroys himself because of shortcuts, false balances, not even being honest sometimes with his own family. It's just he's, he's going nowhere. And uh, certainly, again, who keeps score, family? No, God does. Verse 6, to complete here, the righteousness of the, the righteousness of the upright shall deliver them but transgressors shall be taken in their own naughtiness. That's the way it is. They, they do it to themselves. They destroy themselves. But we know that on that path that you cut in your life, that there is one that said, I am the way. And he is the only way. So from the Old Testament to the New, uh, when you open a road in your life and make that decision, you make a road that is open, that is straight, straight to the Father's throne, whereby you know there from there flow the blessings. And it, it is those blessings that give you success. You know, hard things happen to us at times that are difficult to understand. Don't let that weaken your faith. He is in charge. He knows what he's doing. And he has a reason for everything. Don't ever let your faith weaken when you're being humble and trying to please God. And there may be troubles come along. Don't let your faith weaken. He's got plans. And he's bringing together in these end times a people that can get it done. That's why he chose his election. Now, we're going to go to New Testament. Let's go to the book of Timothy. Make it Second Timothy, chapter 2. I'm going to pick it up in about verse 10 of chapter 2 of the Second Timothy. Chapter 2, brother, and verse 10, and it reads, 
2 uh, Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. Therefore, I will endure all things for the elect's sake. This is Paul speak, uh, speaking to, to uh, Timothy. That they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. You know, that's what's important in life. Is not what this day or next year brings, but the fact that there is a place waiting for you that is perfect. I mean, there's no storms. There's nothing that offends. Everything is put right, and everyone wants to be right, if you inherit that. That's why it's so important to work forward to that. When it comes to false balances, get rid of them. Shortcomings, best get rid of them. What he says, keep my word in your mind, right in your heart, which meaning your mind. And that pleases him. And when you please him, he's, you, can, you can rest assured he's going to bless you in your endeavors. Verse 11, it is a faithful saying. You can count on it. For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If you let your wants of following the world dissipate, die, go away, then you've inherited eternal life. In other words, even in the flesh, you can let, you can let the old flesh man just pass on, and that is to say, out of the way, and your spiritual self takes over should be giving your orders anyway. But some people like to let the flesh think for them. And that will always, uh, unfortunately, lead you in a wrong direction. If we, verse 12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Uh, So, uh, naturally, when... Maybe some people, maybe you would like to tell somebody about the three earth ages, which you know is biblical. And they're going to make light of you, maybe. Don't let that bother you. I mean, Christ suffered for the truth and was called names for the truth. You probably will be, too. But don't let that bother you. Because if you have one person... One person in your entire lifetime that you can have hear what you're saying and come to the Father, it's worth it. Okay. Because that was a child of God that you, you assisted. Christ does the saving, but you sure assisted. That gives great reward. So never worry about it. Sometimes things go a little wrong. You're, you're going to be called names for truth. Who cares? Okay. Verse 13, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, um, uh, he cannot deny himself. So really, whether you believe or don't believe, it doesn't matter. He's always going to be on the throne. He's always going to be faithful. And that's kind of sad because he's there for you if you reach out to him. And don't ever think. Well, I just wish he would hear me. Don't worry. He hears you loud and clear. He probably hears more about you than you'd really like for him to know. And so don't, he's in touch. You can count it rest assured. So um, let him know you love him. That's what he wants from you. Hosea chapter 6, verse 6 demands that. I don't want anything out of you, burnt offerings or anything. I want your love. Verse 14, of those things, put them, of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. In other words, it doesn't matter how intelligent you are or how much you know. When you're talking to a person, you go to their level, whatever that may be spiritually speaking, and you feed them and bring them up. You subvert them. You cannot, you cannot um, uh, convert someone 
by going on about how intelligent you are or all the good things God is, a little bit of what good God has done to you doesn't hurt, but at the same time, go to that person you know, the gift of teaching, the gift of reaching people, is to know you always have brand new listeners, first time. And you have to reach them as well because why? That's the way we grow. If you cut off the first time listener, then your ministry is dead. But when you teach on levels and you go to the level of that one and teach in a way that a child can understand, then your ministry is going to grow. Boy, are we blessed here at this chapel. We receive three to four hundred and sometimes even more than that every day. New. We don't keep all of them, but we keep about 20 to 25 percent of them. What You know, that's an average. That's, that is good. And day in and day out, that growth is tremendous. What does it? God does. You know, man is so helpless on his own with his own wisdom. But when you practice the wisdom of God and when you live that example of letting God lead you, our Heavenly Father, then certainly uh, you reach people. They can see it. You can't fool people. And certainly a set of false balances is not going to work there. All those negative things, it's out the window. But loving Him and following His Word and raising people up and preparing them for whatever it may be, we can handle it when we're in Him. Um, so, prophet is truth. Verse 15, why we came here. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, now, what, what I said that the handle, handling rightly was the title of this lecture. Do, do, can you guess what this word rightly means? Rightly is ortros. It's the word I told you. Build a road. Open it up. That, if you handle it rightly, it will help you build that road. And it won't have all the bad bumps in it. If you just build it smooth, let it flow from God's Word. And, um, and, and the word dividing, it is to dissect correctly. A lot of people take the word, and yes, I'm going to study deep. I'm going to get into this. I'm going to survey. And they haven't got a clue. Okay. They're not dissecting it. Dissecting means you've got to go to the prime roots. You've got to go to the etymology of some words. You have to analyze it. And God will always bless you if you dissect that word correctly, not falsely, correctly, and um, back it up, because God's Word will take care of itself if you have the ability to put it out, to share it, to plant seeds. It's so easy. Do you know that your very presence, when you have the Holy Spirit in you, plant seeds, just being yourself around people? It does. People are drawn to that. And they're drawn to you. Why? Because you have that spirit of truth. Why? Because you've dissected correctly and handled rightly and built the smooth road of understanding and, and followed that. There's only one way you can have that smooth road. We're going to go to it here in a moment. And um, in, in having that and gaining that, then... You gain truth from Almighty God. And when He blesses you, you can't miss. Okay. He's going to see to it. You can't miss. You have the peace. You have uh, solace. And so it is. 16. 
but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto uh, more unright, ungodliness. Uh, and we live in that generation when that's going to happen. It's around you every day. When, when you hear politicians that don't mind standing up and, and, and lying one lie after another when an intelligent person, it's obvious it is a lie. Where's the credibility then? And what's happening to us? Well, God knows, so don't get all shook up. God always takes care of business. And he's in the process. Just ride easy and don't listen to babblings. Listen to your father and let the word speak. Okay, we're going to go to the book of Hebrews. Skip about two books, fill them in. And uh, go uh, uh, Titus, Philemon, and go to Hebrews. And let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Who, who was this book of Hebrews written to? You know, there's a lot of consternation among some scholars. They say, well, Paul didn't write this. It's not his style. Well, it's so dumb. Because naturally the style changed because he's writing to his own people. They know and understand. What, what does Hebrews mean? Let's, let's dissect it. it. It comes from Eber. Do you know what that means in the Hebrew tongue? Those that crossed the river. That's to say the Euphrates when they went into Babylon, from Babylon. That when they crossed that river, that's what Hebrews means, those that crossed the river. Those that came from the holy place and came across the river. That's what it means. So wherever you are lost and wherever you are, it's written to you. As if you be one of God's elect and one of those tribes, and or simply one that loves the Lord and loves to study his word. Chapter 9, verse 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. It wasn't heaven. It was a tent. Verse 2, for there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. That sanctuary means it's called the holy place. Not the holiest of all, but it was a holy place. It was a place to worship. Verse 3, and after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, Here's the holy of the holies. Verse 4, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. That is to say, the very law of God. What do all these things consist of? Why are they there? Manna would only last one day. And here this lasted on and on and on. And as it's written in Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, if you dissect a word, he'll give that manna to you. It's food. It's angel's food, but it's food from God in leading and directing. Why? What about Aaron's rod that budded, didn't die? Aaron was the priest, the Levi priest, the head priest over the tribes. A Levite had to go to each of the tribes to teach. And all the tribes were gathered together in that one rod that blossomed, that didn't die. And how precious it is. And over all this, what else was in there? The commandments, the Ten Commandments. Today it gives us so much trouble. You try to nail those Ten Commandments to a, a public building and 
a scream comes forth and people get so rowdy because they're evil. God's Word is good. You know, it is really, when you stop and think, it's quite amazing that um, the Ten Commandments are the be- they're made up from the best law there is. But if you try to put it on a law place, that is to say a courthouse, I mean, you got trouble, big trouble. But not with God. That's just with man, so be it. But those things are so important that were in there. They were symbolic. Do you know what? You don't even have to worry about those things today. You don't need that rod of Aaron, the Levitical staff. And, and um, you don't need that old tent. And you sure don't need that veil because you know what happened to it. And um, verse 5 to continue. And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. It was an awesome thing. But you have to speak of it. Why? Because one of those cherubims was who? It was the king of Tyrus, which is one of Satan's names. He was originally one of those cherubs that protected the mercy seat. He earned it, and then he went bad. Pride got him. Pride will do it to you if you allow it. When God gives you knowledge and wisdom, don't ever be prideful about it, or he'll pull it right on back. You'll lose it. So be humble before him. And always be blessed. Um, And um, verse 6. Now when these things were thus ordained, and they were, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. They they preached and they taught and they led into that in that first sanctuary. Verse 7. On the other hand, though, but unto the second went the high priest alone. Once every year, but without blood, not or rather not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. There wasn't enough really to pay for it, I'll tell you. Verse 8, the Holy Spirit, the, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, which as the first tabernacle was not was yet standing. In other words, it couldn't the real reason couldn't come in. Let's talk a minute. When did it really come open to you? When Christ died on the cross at three PM, just at the time the crooked holy priest was supposed to walk in. God rent the veil of that holy of holies from top to bottom. Where you don't need that tabernacle. He said, you come on in any time. Through what? The way, the road, the path, the true path. He, it's there for you. That's the way you build it. Is you build it on His Word. Dissecting the truth. And never letting it fall from your mind. And... Within this, you're taught quite a lesson. There was one evil cherub, and he will bring much hurt to you if you allowed it. But you don't have to. You have power over him. So that's why with that veil rent, you don't have to go through somebody that teaches God's Word. You don't have to go through some priest. You walk right in boldly. You know, the Holy of Holies, because Christ said, come on in. I've opened it up for you. He is now. When he resurrected that third day, he was the many-membered tabernacle body of Christ. Uh, And that is the new building, is his ministry, his people. And you can go in any time you need him. You don't need a go-between. Well, how do how do I pray? You talk to him, you know. If if you, it's really simple. A lot of people say, "Well, I need to write me out a prayer." No, you don't. 
if, if you have a friend and you and your friend, if you're planning, let's say, you're planning a shopping trip. And you're going, you want to go to one place, they want to go to another. So the two of you, what do you do? You talk it over and arrange it so that you both can end up where you want to be and have your thing. But you had to talk about it to get it arranged. Well, that's what prayer is with God, is talking. If you have a problem, tell him. He hears you. That tabernacle is open. It's wide open. And you don't have to crawl in. You can boldly, when you love him, enter into that tabernacle because you know the way, the path. That's why this path is rightly handled. It's so very important. Dissecting the word where you're qualified and your simple love to him and your understanding opens that path that he says, come in, come in, child. God wants you to. He made it real easy for you. And praise God, that's the way it is, okay? And um, so we're going to go then with, with I'm going to do six. And now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always to the first. We got that, accomplished that. But into the second, we got that. Verse 8, the Holy Spirit, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. But as we discussed, it is now. And you can boldly enter. 9, which was a figure of the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not, I repeat, could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. It didn't cut it. wasn't the right handle rightly. Verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances um, imposed on them until the time of reformation. And that reformation is our time. That's when it happened. So, uh, always remembering in that uh, verse 8 that you have, it, when you read verse 8, and it says that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made. It is now. That's why you have to hand, rightly handle and make that road. Open it and walk in. Verse 11 here. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. What building was it then? Verse 12, Neither by the blood of goats or calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having ordained eternal redemption for us. If you take it, if you look for it, if you reach out, if you touch him. Verse 13, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, even a red one, sprinkled, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That's what he wants from you. Well, how do I serve him? Just talk to him. Let him know you're available. Tell him good morning, if nothing else. When you wake up in the morning, tell him good morning. That you, and most of all, tell him you love him. And ask him for help through the day if you need it. He, it makes his day. And when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. As you know, you can count on it. He is so precious. And he's there for you. But here's where you have to be real careful. It, you know, time and experience 
kind of takes out the would bees. Well, uh, just like this. I just wish I could believe. I believe a little bit. No, you don't. You either have faith to know that God created this earth, that he sent that son for one and all times, that blood that redeems. And if you love him and are worthy, he wants you to come in. And But remember from this lecture that um, when you go or trace, let's work on your part. Is that you open the road. Didn't say you build it. You open it. You open it by your faith, by your understanding, and by his leading and walk in. Because there's no other way to have eternal life than to follow his word and to have his blessings in your life. Uh, So, um, and then we would go to verse uh, 15. And um, it would read, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. That's why it's so important. You know, this place... uh, when, when this earth is put back in its proper uh, alignment and the firmament goes back where it was originally, this is one beautiful place. You know, a lot of people say, well, but how are you sure about that? Well, we've got pretty good proof today. You've seen pictures of Mars and the moon. You want to go there? Want to live there? Want to go fishing there? Want to be comfortable there? No. And when they look back at this planet called Earth and take a picture, it's beautiful. It's our home. And God's going to reclaim it just as he reclaims us and put it in order where it will be That eternal life is so worth working for. It's so worth opening that road of understanding because it's forever. And you know, you're you're not uh, there. You're not in a flesh body. You know, flesh bodies uh, they they weigh pretty good. And when you stand between the bones of your foot and the floor, your flesh gets mashed pretty good. It can even ache sometimes, you know. But in a spirit body, there, you don't have any of those holdbacks. You're free. And and you are comfortable. That's why that age has nothing to do with a spirit body. That's why age means nothing to God. He's the same yesterday, he is today, and he is forever. I had a question from someone, and it's fine. So how could he be? He's an old man. How could he do? Look, he's not. Age doesn't have anything to do with the spiritual body. That's why you can call it eternal. And that's why working towards that eternity is so very important. Now to complete, back to St. John that we just had on television. We just taught it, didn't we? St. John chapter 14 and verse 3. You know what leads to this. Father says, in my house are many mansions. The word in the Greek is moni, which means resting places. You don't have to go to heaven to enjoy that rest. You can enjoy it today. Verse 3, St. John 14. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Verse 4, And whither I go you know, and the way you know. The path, you know it. Verse 5, 
Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. And how can we know the way that your road, that your path? How can we know the path? Jesus, bear in mind, these people walked with him. They saw the miracles. Verse 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way. Don't ever forget that. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And there's, there is no way you can. He opened that road for you. That's why he can say, I am. That's the sacred name. I am the way. So you go to him. Talk to him. Let him know that you love him. That, that you want that eternal life. And, you know, that peace of mind is here today for those that wish to choose it. Or you can go the other way. It's your choice. Verse 7, If you had known me, you should have known my Father also, and from henceforth you know him and have seen him. That really threw them. How did they see the Father? Because if you've seen Christ, you've seen the Father. He was Emmanuel, God with us. God looks just like that. Verse 8, Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffice us. Boy, I mean, you know, Christ had a lot of patience. Verse 9, Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but of the Father that dwelleth in me, God dwelling in him. And do you know something? He dwells in you today through the Holy Spirit, if you let him. That's the secret to opening the road, is to recognize his Spirit. The Spirit of the Father and the Spirit of the Son. You know, he paid an awesome price to rent that veil that you can walk in. I mean, that's the holiest of holies. That's where the very mercy seat sits. And you can walk right into it and and lay lay your word right out. And let him know always that you love him. He is that way. There is no other. A lot of religions resent that, and that's understandable. But it's still true. And thank God that's why we have the millennium. Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for the path. Thank you for the way. Thank you for allowing us to dissect the word, Father, to handle it rightly in our lives daily, that we can be a blessing to those that need that word and strengthen them and bless this whole family. We ask it in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. The Mark of the Beast.